We're delighted to have you here with us today. We've always uh, had representation from the Mexican Embassy at our event here. This is our fifth fifth annual conference, and uh, I know that Ambassador Gutierrez wanted to join us, but uh, in the end, actually, his son, was, or, uh, daughter, is graduating from high school today, and so wasn't able to join us. But thank you so much for, for taking the time to be here, and we're really looking forward to hearing your thoughts on the U.S.-Mexico border, cooperation across the border, and all of these issues that are so important to our audience. Uh, thank you so much. No, thank yours. you, Chris, and uh, it is really an honor to address this fifth edition of the Building Competitive U.S.-Mexico Border Conference. It has really become a, a mandatory stopover for participants in the Mexico-U.S. relations academic season, which is really intense here in Washington. And as, um, as Duncan was mentioning, it is becoming <laughs> more crowded by the by the minute. It is really full of events, but this this event is really outstanding in the in the whole in, in, in the whole year, uh, I want to also extend my recognition to the Wilson Center's Mexico Institute and to the Border Trade Alliance for their vision in creating this forum. I think that it is necessary to focus on the on the border as we do once every year in this event. And I also want to thank both uh, Duncan Wood and um, and Chris Wilson himself for the opportunity to to be here. For thanks for for your invitation. Um, I invite you to take a close look at the map of the world. You will find just a very few places, a handful of places, where two countries with such different levels of development share a 2,000-mile border on land and face a wide range of opportunities and challenges. The border puts the asymmetries, the different cultures, and the contrasting visions of the world of Mexico and the United States in direct contact. It is also one of the few places on Earth where a developed and an emerging economy face each other through such an extended ge geographical region. For a very long time, the border symbolized in many ways that cleavage. In Alan writing, writing, writing's words, we were distant neighbors. More recently, we have both embarked upon a journey characterized by reciprocal discovery, joint approximation, and mutual confidence building. In the mid-1990s, the leaderships in both countries transformed the terms of our, friend, of our relationship. For the first time, Mexico and the U.S. engaged each other not only as neighbors, but as true partners and friends. Trade triggered economic integration and accelerated interdependence. Fortunately, people in both countries discovered that interacting with each other brought mutual advantages. Consequently, our societies have generated one of the most complex and interdependent bilateral relationships in the world. This unique collaboration between Mexico and the U.S. reaches its most dynamic interaction at the border. Security, environment, trade, investment, culture, tourism, disaster management, social policy, and many other matters converge at the border. Although we have been reminded that good neighbors can't be taken for granted, political, economic, and social actors should try to appreciate that our common border is one of the most agile and efficient binational regions on the globe. We are privileged to have built this highly efficient region, a space that integrates us profoundly and brings us closer together every day. Our border plays a key role in increasing our global competitiveness as a region, not as countries, as a region. A million dollars per minute, or approximately $1.4 billion per day, is traded across our common border. Around 7%, 70% of, of bilateral trade crosses, uh, bilateral trade crosses the border by our land ports of entry, along with over 1 million daily people's crossing. Every year, more than 300,000 vehicles and 70,000 trucks cross the border. The 10 border states, six on the Mexican side and four on the U.S. side, together represent the, the world's fourth largest economy. Our border is not a, is not a line, it's not a thin line. It is a highly complex and regionally, and, and, and regionally diverse area that, comes, that goes deep on both sides into both countries. 
and holds a variety of local realities and different levels of integration along the, di the, the, the different regions. We have no shortage of examples of the plurality of our border communities with, a with respective public and private sector initiatives. To understand them better, it is essential to experience the border and live it fully, as many of people do. It's like we just heard Congressman Heard mentioning driving those 10 hours along his district to get to every point in his own district. And I'm sure that he has done that not one, but many times. That is why people like him know the border and make the right decisions about the border, because they live there, because they know the realities there, and they, and they listen to the people and their problems there. It is, the, it is not enough to sit in the desk in Washington or Mexico City and then figure out how things may, might be. It is people that live there and deal with the border every day that have the best solutions and we should listen to them. At the border, there are so unique socioeconomic realities. Going west, the Calibaja mega region, home to 90 college universities and 80 research institutions. And then if we move eastward, the Sonora, Arizona mega region, a strategic zone for the automobile, automotive, rail transportation, aviation, and solar energy industries, amongst others. And if we further, further west, we will also find different ways in which the, both countries have integrated themselves. There is, in, in, in some, there is not one border, but several uh, interlocking different local border regions. The rich collaboration between our countries comes with its respective complexity and challenges. Mexico and the U.S. have developed several mechanisms to bring prosperity and security to the border. The 21st Century Border Management Initiative, for example, which come, was the, uh, started in 2010, allows our countries to administer the border region in the areas of infrastructure, secure flows of people and goods, security, and law enforcement. To continue this close collaboration, during Secretary of Homeland Security Kirsten Nielsen's recent visit to Mexico, our government signed, just as an example, two agreements to further enhance border management efficiency. A memorandum of understanding on cargo pre-inspection program and unified cargo processing between our customs uh, institution and CBP. And, an, and, and another memorandum of understanding on agriculture safeguarding, agriculture quarantine inspections of ports of entry and information sharing. In our uh, agriculture and, and, um, and livestock authority, health authority, and CBP as well. These two agreements could not be possible if we didn't have reached a certain degree of cooperation and if we, didn't have, have if we hadn't established before them a wide array of communications and institution building that allow us to move forward and to, get it to, and to turn our border into one of the most uh, complex and most advanced technologically and, and most cooperative in the world. These agreements help, will, will help us facilitate the implementation and development of joint actions and programs to increase trade, customs, customs compliance, and to combat the illicit flow of goods at the border. Prosperity and security in our common border are not at odds with each other and can indeed reinforce each other mutually. In turn, improvement of border infrastructure offers opportunities to enhance both security and prosperity. We need to make sure that the border is secure and, all at, and at the same time open and efficient and that it allows trade to continue to grow and, fl and flow freely. We in Mexico are as interested as the United States in having a safe and law-abiding border region. One side of the border is on our side of the country. It's in our own country. So when people speak of border security, it is not like it is insecure on one side and secure on the other. It needs to be secure and safe and law-abiding on both sides because it is a shared space. And let's face it, crime and illegal smuggling and contraband and problems happen in both sides of the, of the border, not just in one of them. 
So the solution is mutual and it's cooperation. Despite the outstanding level of interaction and the steps taken historically to improve the management of our border, we still come across populist re rhetoric about the border from time to time. Those statements are divisive, misinformed, distorted by stereotypes and prejudices, and have costly consequences for both countries. When this happens, our strong partnership is weakened, our friendship is eroded, sensibilities are offended, and eventually grievances emerge, placing obstacles between friends and neighbors instead of building bridges about, among partners. When negative rhetoric about our border pervades the atmosphere, we need to send a strong political message and to develop public policy that is well-informed and based on the many realities at the border region. We need to make an assertive diagnosis of our challenges and opportunities at the border so we can devise concrete solutions to real problems, always based on mutual respect. The border region reflects on a daily basis the intense, complex, and prosperous relationship between Mexico and the United States. The border is not only key to promote economic development and security, but it is a strategic bridge that connects our, our shared interests. A forum like this one grants us the opportunity to discuss the multidimensional nature of this shared space and help us track the history of our collaboration. I wish that, the, that these discussions are and as has been in the past, a productive contribution to these discussions. So thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Those are excellent remarks. And I think we're going to have a time for a couple questions from the audience. I'm going to take the liberty of, of beginning with a question of my own as we get the mics ready and people can start to think of what, what you'd like to ask. One of the, some of the things you, you said reminded me actually of a conversation that, that we had with the Mexico Institute with Secretary Vidigaray about a year or so ago. He was reflecting, I think, on a, an earlier period even uh, and a visit to the United States that he made. And he said that one of the things that over the past several years that was most concerning to him that he saw happening in the United States was a polarization, uh, sort of a political polarization, an economic polarization in the United States. And, and some of the work that we've done here at the Mexico Institute on public opinion shows us that that polarization has extended actually to U.S.-Mexico relations and has extended to U.S. views of Mexico. So we actually have across the United States views of Mexico that despite every, all the rhetoric we've heard over the last years re remain pretty strong, the overall level of, of support. But we do see this fragmentation of different groups across the United States where there's sort of a hardening of negative opinion uh, among some. The border region is an exception to that in many ways. When people interact with each other on a day-to-day -day basis, when they know one another, they tend to have, and we see this in the data, better views of one another. And, and so what I wanted to ask you about it is, you know, reflecting on sort of this, you know, the, the border is this special space where there's a high degree of understanding and interaction uh, among the two countries, and then thinking about the challenges we face with the rest of the country. How is it that the, the, the Mexican embassy sees this challenge and is attempting to respond to this challenge, which is essentially perception uh, of Mexico, not among everyone in the United States, but among specific communities or, or trying to, to sort of break through and, and, and bring that level of understanding that we have at the border to the rest of the country. It's something that we in, in border forums talk about a lot as well. You know, we're, we say it, we say we're preaching to the choir, we're talking to the people who understand this. How do we, how do we break beyond that? And so I wanted to, to get your take on that uh, in the context of this conversation. That's a, that's a very interesting question. And um, Mexico is very, it's probably better suited to, to face that sort of challenge than many other countries that would have it would be in a, in, a, in a similar situation in the United States. We have 50 consulates in the United States. And that network of presence, of consular presence, of having almost anywhere where there is an important Mexican community in the United States, there is a consulate close by, or reasonably close by. And those 50 consuls complement the, the the, ch the, the, the work that we try to do at the embassy, which is put our message forward. Tell every audience in the United States that Mexico is probably the most important country for the United States overall in almost any, 
almost in any area that you can think about, Mexico is a, is a, is a reliable partner, a needed partner. It is a country that the United States needs to, make, to, to cooperate with to solve common, common problems. And uh, having those 50 consulates, sending the message is, is an incredible asset. And, and no other country has as many consulates, in, in, not only in the United States, in any other country than mm -hmm. Mexico has in the United States. We do use that. We have unified messages. But the, the degree of polarization in this country is such, it has reached such levels that people, not only on Mexican issues, on domestic issues, have already taken the decisions to listen only to those, um, to those news, uh, uh, news outlets that tell them what they want to hear and ignore the rest. And that pervades also to Mexican, U.S.-Mexico relations issues. We have to confront that and we have to go beyond that. And it's, it's, not, it's not easy because uh, there, are, there is a lot of misinformation out there. And to be, to be really direct on this, on this issue, the problem is not from someone at the top getting the rhetoric down. It is that someone at the top read that there is this that those prejudices are the prejudices are there, those misconceptions are there, and just capitalize them politically. Mm -hmm. So it is not a problem that you need to solve it from the top down. You need to solve them from the bottom up. Yeah, thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. If someone from the audience wants to ask one, we'll bring a microphone to you. And if you could please identify yourself and then ask your brief question. We have a, one right over here. Hello, Kate Kempton, Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation. Thank you for your time today. I have a question about NAFTA, and if an agreement is not reached on NAFTA 2.0 renegotiations, do you see a viable way forward in expanding trade policies on a state level between Mexico and the U.S. border states? You mean that on the on a state level, on state to state? Yes, whether it be like between Mexico and California, I know as um, a Californian expat, um, we've been we've been doing that um, in California a lot since since probably the 1950s. Um, but do you see a viable do you see that as a viable solution to continuing trade with the United States just through the border states instead of with on the federal level? Well, first of all, let me tell you that I am an optimist. I think that we will reach an agreement. I think that finally we've come so far as to improve NAFTA in different areas so far in the negotiations. And we still have some important pending issues, but I think that we will find a, a solution that will allow us, the three countries, to reach a win-win-win solution. In the second part, the second part of, your pro, of your question, I think that the way to look at this, these things is, is the following, is we have a tri-national, a, th a three-country agreement that not only facilitates trade and investment between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, but has created an economic region which is called North America. And that region is the one that allows Canada, Mexico, and the United States to compete globally. The competitive edge is in being a, a region and having been in being integrated by NAFTA. Mm -hmm. So the border, both the, the U.S. southern border and the U.S. northern border with Canada and with Mexico are key components of that, of that regional economic unit, integrated unit, which is North America. The, the model that you are proposing will not work globally. It can work between the, any pair of two countries, but we will lose the most important thing. We would lose the perspective of having North America as a competitive, as a globally competitive region that can face challenges from Asia, from Europe, from anywhere, and gives us the edge to really grow and, and, and get better lives for our citizens in the three countries. So let's not think of alternatives. Let's move forward and get that, that, uh, that deal done. 
Yeah, and what you mentioned, I, I guess, also applies to this notion of, of potentially splitting up into two different bilateral accords that, that takes away, that has the same disadvantage that you just mentioned there. Exactly. Yeah. Do we have time for another question? Hi, Marilee, International Trade Today. Uh, another NAFTA question, I'm afraid. What do you think happens now? Is Lighthizer talking to his Mexican counterparts right now, or do you expect that July will be another intensification? And um, where do you think the three countries can go on rules of origin with autos? I am, again, I am an optimist. I, I know that the three negotiating teams keep on working. They have uh, made the decision to um, keep on talking, keep on moving forward. Truly, the um, tariffs on steel and aluminum haven't, haven't helped on the overall environment to in the atmosphere of the, of the trade talks, but they haven't been interrupted and they are still moving forward on, uh, on two different tracks. We deal with the tariffs on one track and deal with uh, NAFTA negotiations on a, on a separate one. And um, I am sure, that again, that as, as we mentioned from the, from the previous question, I think that it is a matter of really finding the best solution for the three countries to get it to a win-win-win situation, and uh, and uh, I'm also on the on the specific part of the of the automotive automotive uh, industry. The automotive industry is present in the three countries, so in the end, what uh, what we achieve in that in that specific industry needs to be uh, needs to be feasible, needs to be um, a solution that is makes sense from the government's perspective and from the trade uh, negotiate, negotiating authority's perspective, but also from the industry perspective. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking the ambassador for his time. Thank you. Thank you.